So the, my sermon title, I don't know if any, you know, they, I guess they come up on the screen, but I have a good time with them. I don't know if anybody else cares, <laughs> but <gasps> your karma ran over my dogma or east, west, which is best. So we talk a lot about oneness here. We talk and we use scriptures from all over and poetry, which <laughs> tell me that's not a scripture, what we just read. Um, we use scriptures from all over. And there are some fundamental differences in the approach of different religions. But the longer I'm on this earth, the less I see the differences and the more I see what's the same. And so that's what I wanted to talk about this morning, this, this um, paradox that they, we can say fundamentally different things and mean virtually the same thing. That is, the, the most important skill you will develop on the spiritual path is to be able to hold paradox and hopefully to hold it lightly. The paradox like um, you are perfect and whole just as you are right now, no changes. And there is this yearning, this imperative within us to evolve and grow and become it's both and, not either or. So in Eastern religions, this is going to make you jealous, those of you who are brought up in any kind of um, fundamentalist Christianity or Judaism or Islam, Eastern religions don't really have a concept of sin. Can you imagine growing up with nobody telling you you're a sinner? Oh, yeah. And here's the thing. On the Eastern paths, morality is assumed. Duh. Duh. You, know, you don't need a tablet to tell you not to kill people or sleep with their wives or steal their cattle or run around telling lies about them. You know this innately within yourself. You know this. And that's assumed in Eastern thought is that morality, pff, that's, that's the given. And then you start on the spiritual path from there. And one of the things I think that happens in, Western, in the Western world is, look, I, I'm, I'm following all 10 rules. Aren't I doing a great job? Um, you know, when really that's just the beginning. That's the tip of the iceberg. So morality is just what works. It's basic logic. It's basic um, the skill of living with other beings and taking up the same space. But the fundamental difference is that in Eastern philosophy, enlightenment is possible. In this lifetime, you can be an enlightened being. And truth is already yours. You are already in Brahman, as the Hindus would say. Brahman is this love that we talk about, this one huge thing that undergirds and comes through and as and everything, everything. It's everything. You're already there. It's the goal, and you're already there. You're on your way home, and you never left. Those are some more paradoxes. So what is the deal? If you're, if you're already there and you've never left, what's the problem? How come we haven't all ascended or just gone into nirvana? Well, that, I think, is here's the task, is we have to clear out the mess that we have piled, that our culture has piled, that our families have piled, that our scriptures have piled, that our own selves, <laughs> we're perfectly capable of doing this to ourselves, that our own selves have compiled that stand between us and our knowing the truth of who we are. We are the truth. Some part of us knows the truth. But man, we might have to dig through a big bunch of paperwork <laughs> to get there. And what is the mess? Easterners would tell you the mess is your desires. Not your desires, but your attachment to your desires and your attachment to the things that you desire. The mess is your behaviors and attitudes that develop around fear, which is based on your desire to get what you want and not get what you don't want and not have anybody take away what you have. Desire really is fear underneath it. We feel like we need something in order to be okay. That's our desire. 
I talk about a lot in here, the prayer under the prayer. You can say your desire is, uh, I, want that, I want that person to be my lifelong love. Maybe. But the prayer under that is, I want to feel loved and secure and supported for the rest of my life, right? That's the prayer under the prayer. So that's this idea that um, we develop all these behaviors around what our attachments are, and we're not even clear on what it is we're attached to because we're absorbing the stories of our culture around that as well. And so here's what happens, not that you have a problem with this. Sometimes we develop a certain need for control in our environment. That is something I'm just going to talk to you about theoretically because it's never happened to me. I'm sorry, I can't even say it. <laughs> um, control is, is a fundamental issue in my life. I grew up in an alcoholic home and in a fundamentalist home, and there were rules. Not only that, my dad was an army colonel. So there are rules and rules and rules and rules and rules, right? So I didn't have much control. I was being told, here's what you do to be a lady. Here's what you have to do to be a Christian. Here's what you have to do to not get hit. Here's what you have to do to somehow navigate through this family. All of those rules. And so I developed this idea of what can I control? <laughs> And I spent all my energy on that, on those, those spaces, or really my illusion that I was controlling certain things because none of us actually has control. So we tell ourselves lives, lies, we believe in our illusions. And also part of the mess is grief and loss. And that's part of desire, which is fear underneath it, right? Not losing the things that we have that we're attached to. Um, and yet, in this life, we lose everything. We don't like to acknowledge that in the Western world and especially in America, but we lose everything, sometimes one at a time, sometimes in big bunches. But in the end, we lose everything. And so grief and loss, and what happens when you don't feel like you should lose everything? is blame. It must be somebody's fault that this didn't work out. And anger, which feeds the blame. Woo, anger, blame, blame, anger, self-righteousness. I have a right to be angry because they're at fault. Do you recognize any of this going on in our world today? We're seeing it played out on a big screen and I know that it gets scary to watch it on the big screen. And what I'm here to tell you is that what we have some measure of influence over is our small screen. And if we'd say, that guy shouldn't be blaming, and that guy shouldn't be blaming, and they're clearly wrong, but we're still screaming at the guy who cut us off in traffic today, then we're not there. Let's work on what we can work on. Guy cut me off in traffic today. I mean, it's not that I mind somebody getting in front of me, but the car in the next lane that was in front of me was not a full car's length in front of me when this guy darted. And it scared me. And first thing I did was lay on my horn and then go, no, that wasn't very smart, but that's, that's my fear. And then I went, I'm on my way to church and I'm supposed to be a minister. <laughs> Thank you for being my teacher. Did I mean it in the moment? You know, kind of, not really. But yes, because what it did is it showed me something about me. What happened there was not about what that, I don't know what that person's deal was. Maybe there was somebody in labor in the car and they were trying to get to the hospital. You never know. But what it showed me is something about me. I woke up and I read spiritual literature and I meditated and I prayed and I got ready for church. And then one person cuts me off and I'm like, eh! <laughs> thank you for being my teacher. I have to be vigilant at all times. I can't just rest. So we get blind to who we are and we get blind to our connectedness because that's the one thing we do not lose. We are all part of the one, that one love. 
And even death cannot take away that love. That death cannot take away who we are. But that's the least thing we often focus on in this life. And so the idea in Eastern religion is that we transcend our attachment to all the stuff and begin to see everything as one. So the guy who cut me off is just an aspect of me. I can say that with absolute belief. That guy who cut me off was just an aspect of me and an aspect of me that I need to learn to deal with if I am to release my attachments. My attachments to not being killed on the highway, <laughs> but my attachment to how dare you not follow the rules of driving that I'm following. Now, there are some rules of driving that I don't follow, like the speed limit, but I'm okay with that, right? This is my teacher. It's all my teacher. It's all my teacher. So the Hindus say, God is this all-encompassing oneness. We live in, but we forget it because our desires distract us from the truth, and our task is to realize the truth that we are by losing our attachment to those desires. And there are many, many ways to do that. Many, many um, methods put forward by Eastern religions, even within Hinduism itself, there are many, 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 and they're tools. They're all tools to enhance our awareness. Meditation, worship, doing a puja, having a puja table, having, holding things and people in your life as sacred so that you can remind yourself that all of life is worthy of your worship, not just this or that, all of it. Tools are celebrations. Remembering, those are tools, celebrations, remembrances. In, in Hinduism, there's karma yoga and jnana yoga and raja yoga and bhakti yoga. There are all kinds of ways, and yoga just means unity, all kinds of ways to realize that we are one. The Buddhists talk about an all-encompassing oneness and not resisting what is. Not resisting what is. <laughs> There's a teacher about control. Y'all, have you ever noticed that what is, is? <laughs> what is, is? How much energy do we spend wishing that what is, wasn't? The other things that, the thing that the Buddhists and the Hindus both use, and I really love this, is this idea. It's called neti neti. Not this and not that. Whatever you think is your salvation, it's not that. And it's not this, and it's not this. Because as soon as you decide it's that, then we attach to it. So not this, and not this, and not this, and let go, and let go, and let go. Now the, relig the Western religions, the religions of the book, of the Hebrew Bible, the Quran, and the Christian Bible, those tell you, um, or the religions that have sprung up from those, not necessarily those books, tell us that we are sinful by nature, that we are separate from God, and we're trying to earn God's good graces. And if we do enough things right, we might get to a place that we call heaven, which the Hindus might call Brahman. But this idea, we're already in Brahman, we're already in heaven, if we're aware that we're in heaven. So, but you have to do certain things to get there. It's narrow, it's exclusive, it's separate. And this idea of being good enough is impossible because you're sinful by nature, so you'll never be good enough. You still have to try, but the only way, this kills me, y'all, God, in God's infinite love and wisdom, cannot just forgive you. Somebody's got to pay the price. So he sent Jesus to pay the price so that if you believe that Jesus paid the price for you, you can now be in heaven. <sighs> so the rules, don't sin, which is impossible. So next, okay, then be forgiven. That's the best you can do. And stay forgiven, which is hard to do if you keep, you know, sinning over and over again. You have to keep your awareness up. Jesus paid the price for you. And Less fundamental religions include some grace in there and some mystery in there. 
And the more fundamental include priests and rituals and rites and rules and hierarchies. And what happens is that we get the idea that our job is to do our best to please God, this judge that is judging us. In Judaism, we're considered sinful but redeemable. They are a religion of the book too, but they're open to discussion and interpretation. I love the fact that in addition to the Torah and all the books of the prophets and the Psalms and the Proverbs, there are also the Talmud, which is generations and generations of people going, what do you think that means? Well, I think it means this. Well, I don't think it means this. I think it means something else. Well, I think it means something entirely different from you two. And, they, and we get to look at all of that and see all the different ways it can be interpreted. Can you imagine that that was actually part of the book of your religion? It's pretty cool. And yet, it's still that idea that we're inherently sinful and we got to figure it out. There's also this idea in Judaism, in mystical Judaism, called tikkun olam, which is this idea that we are here to repair the world. We're here to repair the world. That's what the chosen means. Not chosen because I'm more special than you, but I'm chosen because I have been given and awareness and some tools that might help me heal and repair this world. So I'm chosen to be of service is what that really means. And so the idea in Kabbalah is this, um, that we are all sparks trying to return to our divine light. The idea in Christianity is that somehow we can transcend what's wrong with us and get to the place where all is perfect and we don't have to worry about sin anymore, where we're completely loved, where we're completely forgiven, where there is grace. Now, the Christians would say, you're not going to get that till you're dead. The Jews would say, the only time to get that is right now while you're alive because they don't really believe in an afterlife. The Hindus would say, you're already there, just recognize it. But it's really not that different. Can you see that? Can you see that everyone is saying, we have to find a way to return to love? There is this love. Call it God, call it spirit, call it Brahman, call it Allah, call it what you will, but there is this love. Everyone agrees that there is this love. We disagree on how to get to it. We disagree on whether we deserve it, but we all agree that it's there. And we all share this idea that we want it to be ours. If there is this love, I want to be a part of that. I want that. I want that for myself. I want that for everybody. And so in all of this, there are rules Rules and rules and rules, how you wear your hair, whether you can swear, um, what you care about, what you're allowed to do, um, how you pray, how you speak, um, what the book is, what's the right book, who's your guru, (gasps) do you have a guru, oh my gosh, that's horrible. And then gender and hierarchy and all of that comes into play. But if we let go of all of that, it's love returning to love. We are beings created by love. Some would say created by love and then fallen. But our job is still to return to love. Created by love and forgot is a better word. That's what I like to look at. Because every moment that I'm not living in love, it's because I forgot. It's because I forgot. That's why I read. That's why I meditate. That's why I pray. That's why I come to church. Because I need reminding all the time. And so what it comes down to is this idea of one. This state of no attachment, no sin, no stepping on the feet of others the state of a letting go of our attachments and renouncing everything except the compassion and the love that's allowed to live through us because it is us. Because it is us. 
there's one. Is there a God or is there not a God? You know, you can believe in God and be a Buddhist, but you can also be a really good Buddhist and not believe in God at all. It doesn't matter because God is just a convenient word that we've given to something that we can never, ever, ever understand. I have a quote here, if I can find it. Um, Oh, from St. John of the Cross. Um, No, I didn't write down the whole quote, so I'm just going to paraphrase. So the name of God heaven, nirvana, now, later, perfect as we are, evolving, salt of the earth, light, city of God, perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. All of these are things that we've been told that we are. And what St. John of the Cross says is, no word that you will ever use or thought that you will ever think can encompass what it is because it's bigger than what you can in this human form ever contemplate. We can try to get close. We can trust. We can have faith. We can look for signs. We can acknowledge as we remember. But we, you know, not this and not that. That's exact John the Cross. You couldn't get much more Christian than that. And yet, neti neti, it's not what you think it is. And it's not the other thing either. Because it's too big. If it were small enough for me to be able to figure out, it wouldn't be God, y'all. It wouldn't be absolute love because I love, I love a lot. And I have no idea what absolute love looks like. But I want to. And every day that I surrender my attachments, the closer I get to that. So does it make sense to you that it's really all the same? That there, whether you call it nirvana or heaven or Brahman, it's all this idea that there is something that is so much larger than what we can possibly imagine, and we are that. We're trying to get back to that. And I would say that I'm much more... Buddhist and Hindu than I am Christian these days, as much as I love Jesus, because I believe that it is already mine. You're already there, you're already home, you're already safe in your eternal soul, as the song says. There is no difference. None of it is the truth. Am I, le- am I Melinda? Is that who I am? What if that wasn't my name? Would I be less who I am? Without my name? And which name? You know? And God has the 99 names in uh, Islam. Which God? People think that Hinduism is a pantheist, is a polytheistic religion. No, it's one God represented in a million ways represented currently in about seven and a half billion ways because we are all individuated expressions of that God. And whoa, way into the trillions if we talk about everybody who's ever lived and who will ever live, individuated expressions of that one. Why would we think that any one or group of us could figure out the whole thing? And yet, that's the beauty. That's the final beauty. East, West... Karma, dogma, love. Love. We are expressions of love. Our job is to return to love. Our job is to acknowledge love when we see it. Our job is to express love when we can. Our job is to receive the love that is there for us. And if we can't, it's because there's something we have in the way of the love in us not because the love is not coming to us. I promise you that. The love is here for you right now. So let's start letting go of those barriers in our minds that keep us from it. And acknowledge, you know, it's as simple as namaste. The divine in me, which I cannot even understand truly what it is, recognizes the divine in you. That's all it means. I recognize who you are. I recognize who you are, and I recognize that we are one. And I want to close with another poem of Rumi. 
out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. There's a field. I'll meet you there. Thank you. So I've Ushers, did Jordan give you something to pass it to hand out today? Oh, Perry's got him. Okay, awesome. Awesome. We'll wait till after. So um, I'm issuing a challenge this month for us to, as, a, as individuals, and yet knowing that we hold that consciousness of prayer with each other, that every time we pray, we are praying together because there's no time or space to spirit. We don't have to do it at the same time every day. But to pray this ancient loving kindness meditation for the month of August and see what happens. See what happens in your life. See what happens in this church. So I'm just going to lead you into a short meditation about that. And it's called the Meta Prayer or the Loving Kindness Meditation. And there are many different versions of it. And I'm, I'm handing out one to you um, before the end of this service for you to take home with you. And it has two versions on it. Pray both or either one. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's about translation. <laughs> is the reason there are so many different prayers, exactly how to translate these words, but it all means the same thing. So if you can just, in this moment, allow yourself to let go of whatever you feel grabbing onto you and just focus on this breath. Each in-breath and out-breath, you don't have to tell yourself how to breathe, it just happens. And we innately know that when we breathe in, no matter how good it feels, if we try to hold on to that, it won't feel good. And so we naturally let it go. And every time we let it go, we create a space for more to come in. And thus, we are never without breath. We are never empty. So simply allow that breath and let that breath carry you into the quietest place inside yourself, into this spaciousness that is the heart, the heart of you, the heart of me, the place where we're all connected. ourselves because yes we can there is an object and a subject in each of us there is that higher self that knows everything and there is that little scared self that's our human form and that's as it should be it's okay and yet if we allow our humanness to be informed by that higher self that's when the peace and the joy of love come to us so speak to yourself from this place of perfect love into whatever part of you feels the need for love. And in your head or out loud, repeat these words. May I be filled with loving kindness. I be free from suffering and fear. May I accept myself and others completely. May I be happy and at peace. That may have stirred up some stuff in you. 
and that's okay. I ask you just in this prayer to invite in a willingness to be healed without understanding how. And again, just say, may I be happy. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be free from suffering and fear. May I accept myself and others completely. May I be happy and at peace. And if you feel anything arising in you that is resisting this, I invite you to just say, you're not needed here because I'm safe. May my heart be open and filled with loving kindness. May I be free from suffering and fear. May I accept myself and others completely. May I be happy and at peace. And I invite you to turn that around. I may, my heart may be open and filled with loving kindness. And I think I'll let it. I may be free from suffering and fear. And why wouldn't I? I may accept myself and others completely. Nothing is stopping me. I may be happy and at peace. I have my complete permission. And as you pray this prayer this month, I invite you, when you start to believe it, when you start to feel the peace in your heart, with saying the prayer in the first person to start to turn it outward. May you, whoever, it doesn't matter, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be free from suffering and fear. May you accept yourself and others completely. May you be happy and at peace. My suggestion is that you start with someone you have warm, loving feelings toward that your heart is already open to, and then work your way out for, outward from there. Because the lesson is, don't put anyone out of your heart. You're the only one that can prevent your experience of oneness. And so we expand the prayer. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings dwell in happiness. May all beings everywhere Be at peace. And my prayer now is that you feel some of that peace inside you right now. And you simply welcome it in and say, <sighs> and so it is. And you can return to this place at any point. And so it shall be. Amen. <laughs>